at Undo Software, we, we, we write a, we, we, we sell a, a reversible debugger called Undo DB. Um, how many of you know what an unreversible debugger is? No? Ah, okay. In that case, I shall do a few more introductory slides. Uh, so, um, so this is sort of the outline of the talk. I'll be talking about recording and replaying the execution of programs, uh, saving an execution of a program to a file, loading a recording into UnderDB so you can debug the execution of a program, um, a new thing called Live Recorder, which is a, a, di a different way of recording the execution of a program. Uh, and then I'll do a little interlude about talking about um, how you can do scripting in GDB, in recent versions of GDB. There's a Python extension in which you can do a few useful things. Uh, and then some sort of hot off the press stuff, which I call reverse data flow analysis, um, which uses our technology to enable you to do things that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to do. So, um, yeah, so we're a company called Undo, uh, founded 10 odd years ago by myself and uh, Greg Law. Various rounds of funding and all the normal sort of things, um, backing and customers and things like that. Um, so, reversible debuggers, it means you can debug a program and you can go step backwards as well as forwards, um, which is really useful, really useful for, for finding bugs in, in software. Um, and we think UnderDB is about the first time this has been done in a way that's practical. Um, so it's used in very, very complica complicated software. We're used in scientific clusters. Uh, lots of EDA uh, people use our, our code to debug their software. Um, in fact, it works on in any compiled code on Linux is the essential of what it works on. And this is a customer quote, which actually isn't all that unusual. Um, when you can go backwards, it really does make a big difference um, to, when you, to finding certain really hard bugs. Um, so this is a quote from quite a long time ago. Um, the practice of programming, I, I think that's probably the 1970s, I don't really know. Um, so even in those days, they were talking about debugging involves backwards reasoning. Um, they used the analogy of solving a murder mystery. Um, if you're solving a mur murder mystery, the, you, you have the end state, you have the dead body, you don't know what happened in the past, and you're trying to figure out what happened in the, in the past. And that's a bit like debugging a program. Often when a program crashes, you've got the end state, perhaps a core dump, and you've got to try and figure out what happened in the past to cause the core dump or the problem to, have to, to occur. Um, so we like to think it's sort of closed circuit TV for your code, because you're recording of everything that's happened, um, which enables you to find a bug much more easily. Um, so one of the things we've worked very hard on is performance. Um, so the naive way of doing reversible debugging is you look at every instruction and um, if the instruction overwrites a register, you store the previous value of the register. And you could do that for every single instruction that the program executes. And, and, and to go backwards, you fabricate the previous contents of registers and memory and things like that. Um, the obvious problem with there is, is the overheads of time and space, uh, billion instructions per second. So you've got to it doesn't, it's not practical. I think actually for some embedded devices there is a thing you can connect to a particular special build of an ARM chip that enables you to stream this data to a hard drive and you get a few seconds of recording. But in general it's not, not a practical approach. Um, so we don't do it that way. Um, so we take advantage of the natural determinism of the computers. Normally when you run a program it does the same thing every time. If you add two numbers together the result is always the same. Um, so we, we don't store the results of deterministic instructions. You don't need to. You can recreate those as and when you want to. But instead, we have to then store the results of non-deterministic instructions and operations, such as system calls, uh, which behave differently each time you call them. For instance, if you read from a socket, uh, the first time you read, you get some data. If you read again, you'll get different data. Uh, and in general, all system calls can, are non-deterministic. They, they can potentially behave differently each time you call them. Um, so we use this technique and it re reduces time space overheads by many orders of magnitude. Um, to get control of system calls and record what they did, we used a, a, a JIT binary translation. <coughs> and this is an example of, of, of our efficiency or speed. Because um, GDB has a very simple uh, thing called process record that, that tries to do reversible debugging, uh, but it's very slow. Um, and this, this example, we've got a run of, GD, of GZIP 
Um, and normally it takes one and a half seconds. With MongoDB, it takes two and a half seconds. With GDB, it takes nearly all day. Um, so if you have a bug in GZIP, you can't debug it with process record, but you can with MongoDB. And, and the space overheads as well um, are sort of fairly enormous with, with GDB, but with uh, MongoDB, they're fairly modest. Um, one thing you might notice is that the, the file that we're gzipping in this example is uh, 16 megabytes long. The memory overhead of MongoDB is just a bit more than 16 megabytes, and that's not a coincidence. Uh, effectively, we've had to store the data the program read from the file, and there's 16 megabytes of it, plus a few other things. Um, okay, so I'm going to give um, a quick demo. Um, of a memory corruption bug. Um, so I've got a, a file called cache C, which is a, a program with a de deliberate bug in it. Um, I hope you can all see that. It's a little bit small. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a way of making it bigger. Sorry. Um, so this program has a, it's a cache. It has a 100, 100 entry cache. Um, each one is a number and a square root of that number. You've got a program, a function called cache calculate, which takes a number, looks it up in the cache, and returns a square root from the cache. If it's not in the cache, it calculates a square root, puts it in the cache, adds a couple of other entries nearby in the cache, so we're assuming some sort of locality, um, and returns a square root. Uh, and the main function initializes the cache, then does an infinite loop, makes a random number, and checks that cache calculate returns the correct square root of the number. And if it doesn't, we get an assert fail. Um, so, just a little bit of background. MongoDB is a MongoDB is a, is a sort of a, a, an engine. It's a it's not a fully fledged debugger. We have other debuggers are sitting on top of us um, that provide the user interface. Um, so, for this demo, I'm going to be using uh, KDBG, which is a I think a KDE standalone debugger, which I've modified so it knows about reverse um, instructions. Um, I think. Oh, I haven't yet to get it. I need to give it the file to actually debug. Okay, so um, here's our program in KDDBG. And what we're going to do now, I'm just going to resize this so that my screen is a little bit different from the screen you're seeing. Um, if we run the program, actually, I'm going to do that again because I, I don't want to set that breakpoint. I want to demonstrate something. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's um, let's run the program, and we've ended up here in this stack trace. We've called assert because the square root doesn't equal the correct square root. So our cache has failed; it's returned an incorrect value somewhere. Um, so ordinarily, you've got um, this is all you've got. You've got stack backtrace here. We're, we're deep inside it, libc in the assert handling, uh, in, and it's called abort, and well, if you're, trying to, if you're trying to debug this normally, you're a bit stuck because all the, all, all the stuff that's happened in the cache is in the past. It's been lost. But we can go backwards. So I'm going to set a breakpoint there. And there's a, you'll notice this button is a reverse continue. It's like a normal continue, but it runs the program backwards. So I'm going to press reverse continue. And here we are. We're actually out on this assert statement now in line 81 of main of cache.c. Um, and now I'm going to do reverse step over, which is like a normal step over, but it goes backwards. So I click that once, we end up on this statement. Click it again, we can go back like that. Okay, so, and we can go forwards as well. And you'll notice these values here were changing when I went forwards and backwards. Uh, they, they change, and, and, and uh, that square root is changed to 13. So if we go just as forward a little bit, we ought to see what's going on. Square root cache is zero. The correct value should be 16. Number is 255. We're using 8-bit integers here for simplicity. So in 8-bit arithmetic, the square root is 255 is indeed 15. Um, but the uh, square root from the cache is, is 0. So the cache has returned 0 rather than 15. Um, and again, if, even if we were here in a normal debugger, we'd still be stuck because we're not in cache calculate. We don't know why it's returned the wrong, the wrong value. But we can go backwards. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to step into cache calculate. I'm going to do reverse step into which is that button. And that'll take us to the end of cache calculate, just before cache calculate returned. 
So I'll do that, click there, and we're up in the end of Cash Calculate. And let's see what's Cash Calculate has been doing. Cash Calculate has been doing while well, I'll go back. And here we are. So what's happened is it's been giving a number 255. It's found it in the cache, and it's returning the square root from the cache. So it's cache element 90. Well, um, cache element 90 contains 255 and 0. So that's the cache has been corrupted, which is unfortunate. Um, if we have a corrupt cache, you know, it's a very difficult bug to, to find because it's happened in the past. It's a really nasty sort of bug. Um, so even if we, we were here in a normal debugger, we'd still be stuck because we still don't know who wrote those incorrect values into the cache. Um, if you had a normal debugger, you might have to, I don't know, what would you do? You'd run the program many times, perhaps, with lots of printfs. Um, you could possibly set a breakpoint uh, whenever we write to the cache. But of course, it, there could be thousands of correct writes to the cache before the wrong, the incorrect write to the cache. So the printf will print out lots of data before they print out anything useful. The breakpoint would hit lots and lots of times. You'd have a nightmare trying to pick, figure out this bug normal, using a normal, normal debugger. But we've got a very, very neat little trick we can do. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set a watch point on cache element 90. You've heard of watch points in debuggers, yeah? Um, so that's a watch point on the memory of cache element 90. And I'm going to run backwards. So what's this going to do is uh, run back to the most recent time that anybody wrote to this particular cache entry. Um, this is a very small demo, so it's going to go very quickly. If it's a bigger program, it might take a bit longer. Um, so if I, if I click reverse continue now, we're back in Cache Calculate. This is an earlier call to Cache Calculate. And you'll notice that Cache 90 contains 40 and 6, which is a correct value at the moment. And we're just about to overwrite Cache element number 90. So if I step forward one line, keep an eye on the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the Cache element change. We've written number, now we're going to write the square root value. So that's the corruption happening in front of us. Um, and I can go backwards again, and we can, see, we can uncorrupt it and forwards again as many times as we like. So yeah, it's kind of cool. So we've found the bug. We've found who's corrupting the cache. Um, now it's a matter of inspection to figure out what's going on. Um, let's have a look at the code. Uh, so we've calculated the square root. We're setting the square root to 2. We're setting the number of thing to number 2. Well, number 2 is minus 1, which is like slightly odd. Um, that's why this is getting set to 255, because it's getting rounded to 8 bits. Uh, and then, well, number two is minus one, so this square root is going to have all sorts of problems. Um, so we found our bug. The, the bug is that number two is set to minus one. We're trying to calculate the square root of, of a negative number. Why are we trying to do that? Well, look at this loop here. We're looping. Number two is looping from number minus one to number plus one. And number is zero. So that's our bug. This, this loop is incorrect when number is equal, to my, is equal to zero. So there you go. We found a rather nasty bug in a cache by going backwards. Um, obviously, most caches are a bit more complicated than this, but um, under DB works fine with larger programs. It might be a bit slower, but you can use exactly these sort of techniques uh, to find rather nasty bugs that happened in the past. In particular, reverse watch points are really, really powerful. Um, so, a little bit of background here. Um, It's one of these things we don't like to admit that we do. We spend lots of our time debugging. <coughs> um, I think there's, a, there's various estimates. This is a particular study from Cambridge University in, in the UK. Um, probably half of our time is spent debugging. Maybe it depends on how well you write the code in, in the first place, but um, maybe we don't want to admit it. But I, I certainly write code that has bugs in all the time. Uh, and it's just one of the facts of life that's a bit embarrassing. and We don't like to think about it, but it's true. So if you can make debugging much more efficient, you can have massive difference in massive improvements to the efficiency of developing code, which means we can um, you know, write more interesting code. We can do more interesting things and not spend hours of our life trying to track down stupid memory, memory corruptions and things like that. So from a business case, improving the efficiency of debugging is, is, is really important. Or you can get even sloppier because now you have <laughs> much better. Of course, that's a danger. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think. Yeah, there's always this um, <coughs> debate about whenever, whenever there's a, a new tool, on, not just in computing, 
um, you know, whenever somebody writes a better, you know, designs a better pen or a better this, or make, allows you to use calculators rather than doing multiplication by hand, there's always the question that you might have been better off doing it by hand. Um, I, I, think that, I think my answer to that is just have as many tools as you possibly can, but use them with discretion and don't let them, be, make, you, don't let them make you lazy. Um, it, and the thing is, there are some bugs that slip through with the best of intentions and are nightmares to debug. So, yeah. Uh, so, just a few background things. We work on Linux only, uh, x86 and ARM. Uh, we're working at the moment on ARM64 support. We don't yet support ARM64. Uh, we haven't actually gotten ARM64 hardware. We have to use emulators at the moment. It's quite new. So, we don't need to modify the kernel, the Linux kernel. Um, you don't need to recompile your program. Obviously, you might want to debug it, have, have debug symbols in your program so you can see source information, but um, you don't need to. So we, we, we cope with basically all applications. They can have threads, signals, and shared memory. They can do all sorts of things, and we'll cope fine. Um, so as you saw in the, in the cache demo, it's a particularly useful thing is when a, a bug happens here, and, only, and only, you only see the results later on. That's the sort of canonical use case of a reversible debugger. Um, one other thing is non-deterministic failures. Um, if you have a program that fails like once every thousand times, you run it randomly. Debugging it is a nightmare because you might run it a thousand times and capture the bug. And you run forward and set a breakpoint and have a look at the state. Um, then if you, go, if you step forward too far, we've all done that in debuggers, you're stuck. You've got to then run it another thousand times on average. To, try again. Similarly, if you think, oh, if I set a watch point there, I can then find out, ah, oh, I've got to run it a thousand times, set the watch point. And then you think you set the watch point in the wrong place, you step too far forward. The whole thing is just a nightmare. Um, so, but if you have a non-deterministic bug like that and you capture it in UnduDB, you've got it forever. Um, you, run, you might have to run it a thousand times, but once you've captured it, you've got it. You can go backwards and forwards, so you can change your watch points, you can change your breakpoints. Um, the whole thing becomes much, much easier. Um, if you've got some code you're trying to understand that you didn't write, or maybe the code that you did write that was quite a long time ago, being able to go backwards, see who called you, see why they called you is very useful. Um, one other thing about UnduDB, it actually makes the simple bugs much easier too. I mean, even the simple bugs um, can take, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of your time. With a reversible debugger, you might be able to get them in five minutes, which is a really good, useful tool. So you can spend that extra 25 minutes doing something interesting. Um, and we're a full uh, debugger. As you saw, we had watch points um, you can attach to existing process. Um, and we are <coughs> we, we, we're an engine that other debuggers can use. So I showed you the KDBG <coughs> uh, front end. Um, we have a normal GDB command line uh, front end as well, which I'm going to be using for the rest of this talk, actually. Uh, and you can use it from within Emacs and Eclipse and things like that. Uh, so this is a more specific list of bugs we're good at. Um, so you store bugs with long run time, so you don't have to run the program many times to capture. Uh, frequently called functions, an interesting one. If you set a bug in a frequently called, uh, set a, if you've got a bug in a frequently called function, you've set a breakpoint. It hits every single time. Sometimes you can set a conditional breakpoint, but not always. So. Intermittent bugs, as I saw, yeah, we talked about that. Um, Stack corruption. Now, this is an interesting one. Maybe I'll show you this one. Um, this is a very, um, it's a very stupid program. And what this program does, well, I'll run it. If I run it, right, it's stopped now. And what's our stack? We have no stack. Uh, this is a, you could probably look at it by inspection, see what's going on, but in the bigger program, if you stop or someone, you've got no stack. You don't know what function you're running. You don't know who's called who. You don't know what any variables are. You're completely stuck. Um, we could look at registers. And actually, RBP, it's just sort of the stack thing, has been set to zero. So that's why. Um, and the other thing is um, <laughs> we haven't even got a program counter. So the whole thing is a nightmare. We have no idea where the program is and what it's done or anything. And you, you normally, you're completely stuck here. Um, it's almost laughably simple to figure this out with a reversal debugger. We're going to step back one instruction, and here we are. We've now got a program counter, and we've got a stack pointer. 
just in one simple operation. Uh, so we now we know we're in the function foo. So for instance, we can say a breakpoint there, run back to the breakpoint, and step forward and see what's gone on. And you can probably see now we've got this thing on the stack, and we've there's been a, a memory overwrite that's overwritten its own stack, and that's what that will happen. That's what happened. So yeah, there's a bug you couldn't fix any other way really. Um, memory leaks. Uh, you can use watch points. If you've got a memory leak, you might be able to set a watch point, a, a watch point in the mem in the memory buffer that you've seen, and see who last modified it. You, if you have access to the the malloc data that often precedes a block of memory, you can set a watch point on that and see where who mallocked it. Go back to where it was mallocked. Um, debugging real-time network protocols. That's kind of an interesting one. Um, if you've got uh, your program talking over a socket to some, somebody else. Um, if you stop it in your debugger, you're going to get timeouts. Often things will time out after 30 seconds and things like that. So debugging those sort of things is very hard. With a reversible debugger, um, you just run the program com to completion. And then at your leisure, you can go back and take time and explore with, w without having to worry about sockets timing out or, the, other, or the, the, the thing you're talking to giving up on you. Um, so another one is race conditions. Um, I should say that, um, maybe I'll explain this later as well, UndoDB serializes threads, unfortunately. It's not ideal, but it does. Um, it does that to make it possible to replay what your program did deterministically. But you can still use it to catch quite nasty uh, race conditions. How much time are we doing? Perhaps I won't give a demo of that because I've got a few, quite a few things to get through. Um, data structure corruption, you've seen that. Actually, maybe I'll give one demo of a, of a, of a race condition. Uh, I'll give a deadlock demo. So this is a program um, with 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 a, with a list uh, which is protected by mutex. Um, I know we're in a C++ conference, but I'm afraid these demos are all C. Um, I'm kind of old school, um, and, and, and actually the language doesn't matter. We don't care what language something's written in. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is, um, in the main function, we're going to um, create, create, create some lists, uh, sorry, create some threads, and in each thread we're going to run um, tester function. Uh, the tester function is going to do random operations on, on, on the... Uh, the, the shared list structure, which should be thread safe because it's got a mutex. So if we run this, um, this is the output. It's it stopped. It's still running, but not making any more progress. Um, so let's stop it and let's see what. So let's see where we are. Um, we got these threads. So this is the main thread. These threads are both stuck in the same place. They're both stuck in um, list lock in deadlock.c line 37. So they're both in this line here. So this pthread mutex lock function is not returning. So we go, we go to deadlock. Um, so how do we figure out what's going on? Um, well, presumably somebody's locked that mutex and hasn't unlocked it. Um, all this code uses list lock to lock the mutex. So we could do a kind of a little neat little trick. What we're going to do is hit a breakpoint on that line, and we're going to run backwards. And that will run backwards to the most recent time that anybody successfully acquired that lock. So let's run backwards, and here we are, we've hit the breakpoint. And well, let's carry on and see what happened to that, that breakpoint, to see what happened to this, this thread that's now acquired that lock. So we're in here. So this is a, it's unlinking an element from the list. So it's doing the right thing, it's, it's, it's grabbed the lock, it's um, looping through the, the list, and it's going to the end, unlocking and returning. So it seemed perfectly reasonable. But actually what's going on, it's returning there. So it's returning without unlocking the mutex. Now, of course, you all know C++, and no, no, nobody say would write code like this, would always use RA AI to do this properly. But obviously you can see that other bugs might happen in this sort of way. So there you go, reverse debugging helps find a, a deadlock bug. Uh, you've seen data, data, data structure corruption. Um, 
dynamic code is kind of interesting. These days, quite a lot of code is dynamic. Java interpreters and things like that are generating code on the fly. Um, and that changes. It's very, very, very difficult to debug. But if you've recorded it, you can replay much easily. It makes it very easy to actually step through even dynamic code. And as I said earlier on, it helps with simple bugs too. Um, so here's a bit of background about how, how it works. Um, so we have two modes. The first time you run your program, we call record mode. It records what happens. And then the second time, it replays. So the when we're recording, all non-deterministic oper operations are recorded in, in, in what we call the event log. So system calls, the results of system calls, uh, which are not deterministic. If a signal comes in at any point and calls a signal handle to be called, we have to record that as well. Similarly, uh, thread switches. We record the exact times at which thread switches occur. Non-deterministic instructions, some CPU instructions, not many, but some but give different results each time. So we have to record exactly what that instruction returned. Uh, if you read from shared memory, uh, clearly that's going to change each time you run the program. So we have to record what was read from, from shared memory. Uh, and then so when, we, when we replay, uh, we don't run system calls. We've said instead we replay the effects of the system calls from the event log. So there's no interaction with the outside world. Um, so if you do a printf in your program, first time around it'll work. Second time around, when you replay, nothing will, will appear on the terminal. Um, so um, the event log. Oh I'll, no, actually, I'll, maybe there's a little graphic here that shows you maybe maybe help. I don't know. Um, so you're in record mode here at the beginning of your program. You run forwards. You're you're here at a four millisecond, um, and then you might go a bit further forward. And then if you do a reverse step or go backwards somehow, you you go back to here in time. And then if you run forwards, you're then in replay mode up until you reach here. Then you go back into record mode. Um, so replaying forwards takes you back into record mode. You can jump straight to record mode using this command. Uh, you can. This is very really nice. You can. We have a measure. We have an. We have a way of measuring time, and you can go directly to a particular time, leap around in the execution to see what's happened as much as you like. Um, you can in the debugger. You can modify the state of your program yourself. You can change registers, change memory, and carry on running. But you can't do that in replay mode because if you did it in replay mode, you'd be changing behavior, and we, you can't change history. Uh, and you can do use it, you can call function calls just like a normal debugger to print out uh, structure results and things like that. Um, so I said we were storing the results of system calls in the event log. So the event log is a memory data structure. It can fill up, of course. Um, so you, if it fills up, um, maybe you read lots of data from the outside world. If it fills up, you can uh, make it larger from within MongoDB, or you can set the, the size when you start. You can also make it circular so that you can run uh, essentially forever just by discarding earlier history as the buffer fills up, uh, which is kind of very useful for long running programs because most bugs, you know, a lot of bugs happen in the past, but most of them don't happen in the really far past. They normally aren't too, unless you're really unlucky, um, you don't need the entire history of the program. Uh, you can get information about um, the events in the event log. Maybe I'll um, show you this actually. So this is the same program I ran last time. I'm running from the command line because it, these extra commands can be used. Um, so I'll show event stats. There you go. There's a lot of curious um, syntax here, a legacy from using GD GDB6, which didn't have a proper extension mode. So this is going to show statistics about all the events from the beginning to the end of the program. So this program. There were uh, 38 sort of non-deterministic instructions. Um, one new thread was created. Three calls to read, the read system call. 23 calls to the write system call. That's, that's probably these 23 or these lines here of output that the program just wrote. It opened four file descriptors. It mapped 15 times. So you can sort of get a, a feel for what your program's been doing. Um, you can also. Uh, show events, um, you can sort of show the last 10 events like this. 
actually it's not, it's more than the last 10 events, never mind. Um, so this is all the events your program did, in fact, as it, from when it started to when it finished. Um, I'll maybe explain about BBCAN later, this is a measure of time. So very early on, uh, there was a, an event non-deterministic, a few more there. Later on, there was MMAP. This was probably LibC on startup mapping in various bits of code and stuff out of your program started going. And then down here, um, some writes that were from the program itself. Um, so that you can sort of get an idea for what your program has been doing. Um, <clears throat> ah, yes. Yeah, so. Um, we have this measure of time. Maybe I'll demonstrate that as well. Uh, let's run again. Um, if I do beget, this is a simulated time of 490,000. They're actually basic blocks. I'll explain what a basic block is later, but it's a account of how many instructions your program has run. We can go to um, an earlier time in the program, maybe 200,000. And if we do backtrace, we can see we're not at the end. We're, we're somewhere in the middle of the program. And we can hop around in history as much as we like by, by giving a number to the, uh, specifying a number to the b go to n command. Um, you can set bookmarks so you can um, uh, undo db. And you can go, I won't go into details of this, you can set bookmarks and go back to the named bookmarks and things like that. Um, so uh, one of the interesting things about go to n is that you can use it to sort of do a binary search in the history of your program's execution, which is kind of powerful. And it's quite a new feature, but it, it's a, it can some, sometimes can be a real lifesaver. Um, as I said earlier, um, we serialize threads. Um, so uh, it's like, it's this equivalent to running on a single core CPU. And as we all know, running on a single core CPU some bugs you don't, don't happen, some really complicated race conditions can't happen on a single core. So this is unfortunate. It means UndoDB hides certain bugs, uh, which is a shame. But you can still find other bugs, as you saw in the deadlock problem. Um, so what we do, we let, in record mode, we let the, uh, the operating system schedule, scheduler select which thread to run next. And in replay mode, uh, we, re we don't let the, the, the operating system kernel is not involved and we replay exactly, exactly what happened the first time. Um, so this is something a little bit new. Um, this, is, this, is, this, this is a feature where you can save your execution of your, of your program into a file and load it at a later date into UndoDB. And, and so you can perhaps maybe give it to somebody else to help debug your problem or help debug. So it's quite a powerful feature. It also means that when you've captured a bug, <coughs> you might want to save it. If it's a, it took a long time to capture, you might want to save it to a file just in case something goes wrong. Your computer might crash, or heaven help us, under DB might, might crash as well, or something like that. If you've got a recording into a file, you're safe. You can always reload it. Um, so that, that's kind of a useful sort of um, uh, feature. Um, I, I'll maybe demonstrate that. Um, so let's run the cache demo, run save, I'm going to call it uh, foo.undo. Takes a little bit of a while. Um, and then exit. Uh, H. Ah, beg your pardon. I need to sort by time. There you go. So that's the foo file we've got created. It's eight megabytes in size. So that contains the entire history of the, of the cache demo we just run. And I can load it uh, like that. So we're not running the program now. Um, so we've loaded a recording. We're currently at the beginning of the recording. And we can continue. Notice there was no output here, because the program isn't running. We're replaying here. Um, but we can see where the, the stack trace is, as we saw before. So we can, we can set a breakpoint, do all the stuff we were doing before, and, and, and debug the problem. Um, and we could be on a different machine here. We could be in a different office. Somebody else could be debugging the program. It, it's a really powerful, powerful idea. Can you open those files in Not in the GUI one, unfortunately. Um, I, there's no particular reason why we can't. I haven't, just, I haven't made the changes to that GUI. Um, That's actually a feature of this talk. As we get further on, uh, I'll be doing features that have no GUI representations. So I'll be doing quite a lot of typing on the terminal. Um, so apologies for that. 
Um, so th th this sort of, when you have a reversible debugger, it's kind of important that you don't use it like a normal debugger because that's, that's not really exposing the power of it. So we think you should work differently. So normally when you're using a debugger, you've got this back in the back of your mind, this fear that you're going to step forward too much and step over the problem. <clears throat> so you really care, you think really carefully about, should I set a breakpoint here or is that too far in the, fo in the, in the future? If I, oh, I make sure I, I do step into, not next, because next will step over function calls. We've all done that many times. Um, with a reverse debugger, you don't have to worry about that. Just forget about it. Just go forwards. If you go, if you go forwards too far, it's fine. Let's go back and try again. Um, so you've got to think back. And, uh, and when you're trying to find the bugs, don't try and anticipate where they are. Just, just go forward and then explore history so that we, we, we think they sort of think backwards is, sort of, is the right approach to take. Um, use reverse watch points. Reverse watch points, as you saw, are really powerful. Uh, they're sort of the best thing about MDDB. I think they're really cool. <coughs> um, I won't demo this, but this is uh, uh, an example of how going back in history is kind of useful. If you have some state in your program that's wrong, um, you want to find in, in, in the past what, where, where it got corrupted. If it's a cache, you can maybe set a watch point, but it might be something more complicated than that. It might not be simple. So you can use undb go to n um, to step back in a sort of a binary search sort of way. So you step back by powers of two until you might want to print out some complicated data each step. And then you find the data is now in a good state. You can then step forwards and use a binary search just by doing um, so you, you step backwards by one, two, four, eight until the state is correct. Then you step either backwards or forwards by decreasing powers of two to hone in on it. Um, it's kind of more complicated to explain than probably just to know. To, to, to know. I think you're all ahead of me here. Um, I kind of like to think of this as sort of like an external binary search because you you're sort of you don't you don't have a bounded before and after at the beginning, but you find it and then you do a normal binary search. Um, I sometimes wonder whether we should wrap this up in a little, uh, little macro or something that, or command that does it automatically for you. So, it oh, git bisect. That's it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that'd be dead easy to do. Um, I, there's another thing I'm going to talk later. I'm sure how we do the time. Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, where we'll be showing some Python extensions. Um, and a Python extension is that the GDB provides, allows you to do this sort of thing in a really nice way. So what we'll talk about now, live recorder. So this is a new thing this year. Um, so up till now, we've been using a debugger to uh, record execution. This is different. You, you can record, uh, it's a library that has our engine in it. You link it into your code and ship to your customers. Uh, by default, it does nothing. But it has these functions here. Um, that's undo live recorder. And so basically, your application can record itself running. Um, so the idea is that if your program's got a problem, got a bug on the customer site, um, you can activate it. You can have, a, you have your user click a button and tell it to start recording and re try and reproduce the problem on the customer site. Uh, it'll generate a recording. Uh, rec the customer sends a recording to you. You then load into UndoDB and you're debugging the session uh, with no, and you don't have to worry about some strange feature of a customer's machine, which is part of the reason for the bug, and you, that's why you can't reproduce it, because you're, you're recording a, a copy of the, the, the customer's execution. So that's kind of a, a, a kind of powerful sort of thing. Um, one other thing uh, which we kind of rather like for this and is that you can use it in internal testing because it's, with a normal debugger, you have to type run and you have to type under db dash save and various things like that. This, if you link the live recorder into your, one of your test programs, um, you can capture it on your test machine and, and then debug, load it into your debugger on your machine and debug it very easily. Um, and of course, it's for customers, it's a slightly different sort of use case, but it's, it, it's really useful. Um, and so I'm going to do a very quick, if I can, uh, I'm going to modify cache.c. Um, to use Live Recorder. So let's pretend Cache C is a program you're sending to a, um, a customer. I'm just going to. So here's the header file that Undo Live Recorder comes with. Um, it's a pretty simple, very simple API. Um, we've got this sort of error structure. So you call Undo Recording Start, 
and it, you pass an error as that parameter. Uh, you can stop recording, you can save a recording to a file, you can save on termination, which is useful. That means um, don't save now, but when I exit, however I exit, I might be killed by a signal or I call return uh, save to this file name. And you can do save on termination cancel. And those two are kind of useful because what you could do, what we're going to do now is you call save on termination and then just before you exit correctly, you call under db save on termination cancel. And that means you get a recording if your program exited for a non-standard reason for an error. So let's have a look. Um, I think, have I got... So here's the, the, the source code for the, for the uh, cache demo. I'm going to ha ha include the header file. And I'm going to put a call here to... I'm not going to check errors in this example. Now I'm going to... So I'm going to say, on termination, save a recording to bar to undo. Pardon? Oh, well spotted, thank you. <laughs> and then here, I'm going to do save on termination cancel because we're, rec we're exiting correctly. I don't have to do that, but that's typically how you might want to do this. Um, you type zero instead of closing parentheses. Oh, yes, well spotted, thank you. <laughs> you guys are better than a compiler. <laughs> I got lazy, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's try and um, compile this. Um, I think I have a comp the compile command in this history. There we go. Actually, I'm going to compile. There you go. We use the math library. We use dynamic linking. This is the live recorder library. So dot a dot a file. I'm going to put symbols in, and I'm going to output it to this different executable called cache-lr. There you go, that's worked. So, let's... Um, so we've got our new executable called cache-lr. We've modified, with, with this modified version of cache-t with live recorder. So let's run cache-lr. <coughs> okay, so it's failed. Now there's a pause here, so it's actually writing the recording out at the moment. And if we look at the files, it's created the recording called bar.undo. It's quite a large file. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but now we can, we, what we're going to do, we're going to load that recording into uh, undo.db. Okay, so we've loaded recording. We're at the beginning of execution. If we continue with the end of the execution, and as before, we can then try and find the bug. So you see the recording was created directly, not using a debugger, but we can now debug the problem. Um, so yeah, so a customer could have sent that recording to us, and we've loaded it onto our development machine, and it, it's all really useful. <coughs> um, so you might have noticed that recording was a few megabytes. It's quite large. Um, there is a problem with this um, that that recording contains all the information that your program loaded. And often customers will have loaded, like for instance, the EDA space, they might have loaded, uh, they might run a sim your simulator program on some design for a chip, which is really secret and very important. And the last thing they want to do is to send a file containing all of their, tra all their secrets to some random developer somewhere who might, I don't know, sell it to somebody. Um, so this is, a, this is a real problem, and, and, we, and there isn't really a 100% solution to this. Um, but what we do have, we do have a way um, of restricting the size of the recording. So we have this, I, I can't demonstrate it because it's, it's still been worked on. But the idea is, we, idea is you have a, a command that takes a recording, and it, it only extracts just, say, the last 10% of the execution time. Um, and the other thing it, will be, it can do is it can trim, and that, that's quite a nice thing. So the, the mi minus 10% means minimum time is 10% back from the end. So it just this gets the last 10%. It's like, like, uh, like Python sort of array uh, specification. Um, so that restricts how much, data, uh, how much recording there is. 
And the minus minus trim, that's something more clever. That removes any bits of memory in the recording that are not actually used by the, by the recording. So it's kind of common that you might load in a massive file into memory, um, like map it into your, into your address space, but actually only access little bits of it. So if you do the, the, the trim thing, then that will be a way of removing, completely removing from the recording, lots and lots of potentially very secret uh, data. It does that only with the last 10%? Yes. So if you, yes, if you have the last 10%, your program is not going to access much, much of the data. Yeah, yeah. So it, normally you'd use trim in conjunction with uh, uh, minus T, I mean, that sort of thing. So as I say, that's coming soon. That's not ready quite yet. Um, um, but that's, that's kind of an interesting sort of uh, area to explore. Order dependent? you trim first and then remove 10% by changing the order of the arguments? Or is it, would you have to do two passes? Ah, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I th it only does one pass. Yes, it, it does the 10% and then trim. Okay, so you'd have to do the two passes? <coughs> yes, <trim> yes, <coughs> yes. Which could be useful. Yeah, it could be, definitely. Um, yeah, you might want to take the output file and, and maybe do a little bit more just to, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so now I'm going to, a little bit of a diversion, uh, how are we doing the time? Because I think it's kind of useful to know about this, I don't know how many of you use GDB, um, but there's a couple of nice things about it which we make use of quite often that I thought might be interesting. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the idea is you can create a script and, if you do, if you, and you can run it from, the, the, the script is a Python program which can import GDB. And, and run GDB commands. <coughs> um, so, uh, some examples. Um, I was talking earlier about programs that fail intermittently, only fail every, once every thousand times. The last thing you want to do is type run at the GDB prompt and then return, and then if it's failed, it hasn't failed, do it again. <coughs> so, you can script this very easily. Um, so, I have an intermittent, I have a, a program here which is trivial. It, it, it reads some random numbers, and every, if, depending on what the random numbers are, it fails. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, let's get a GCC command that compiles this. Have I got a GCC command that compiles this? Ah, oh, I think it's in this window. There we go. Yeah, so that's this program. If it, it reads some random numbers, it, it only reads a thousand times. If any of them are one, it returns one. Otherwise, it returns zero. So let's um, compile that. <coughs> and then... And I'm going to look at this file here. So this um, is a little Python script. And it, re it repeatedly loops until the debuggy returns non-zero. Um, so if we do run intermittent in the debugger, maybe before I do that, I'll run intermittent just to get, give you an idea of it normally passes fine. And I'm not going to do it too many times because it'll just get boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I use it in, in UndDB, or actually, it's, this work in GDB as well. <coughs> um, if I repeat until non zero exit, see the exit code is zero, so it's carrying on. If we leave this long enough, <coughs> I'm a little bit at the mercy of the random number generator here to how long this is going to take. Uh, it should be not take too long. It's much better than that. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, I think that the... Yeah, it, it, you have to have a thousand calls to RAND, none of which return one. So the, it's a, one of those factorial things. You know, I vaguely yeah. remember from statistics, statistics class. Um, so anyway, yeah, we've done it. Here we go. Uh, we've run the program. Exit code is one. Um, and it's printed out error. So you, we've captured it. That's kind of a, kind of a cool thing. We, we, we can now um, you know, do a backtrace and reverse continue. That sort of thing. <coughs> um, and, and we have a, a, a few different ones. We have a repeat and until signal that does a similar thing. And, and if, uh, I maybe I won't demonstrate it because it's fairly easy to see, but it has a similar structure. So we um, GDB provides access to events that have happened. Um, we ask it to um, call our event handler whenever things, something happens such as the signal is delivered. And then we run in a loop, and then we look at the events, and if any of them is a signal event, and it's a 6 seg V, 
uh, we break out of the loop. So it's a similar sort of thing. Um, and I think this, these sort of Python extensions that GDB supports now are, are kind of powerful. I think um, doing scripting debugging is, is a very nice, powerful sort of idea. Um, okay. So I'm going to, the last section of the talk um, is sort of current work, if you like. Um, so, <coughs> so I'm going to call this data flow analysis. Generally, when we're debugging, we're trying to figure out why did the debuggy end up in this, in this state? Because this state's wrong. Something's gone wrong. Um, so we have reverse step, reverse step I, reverse finish. We set breakpoints, reverse continue, watch points, reverse continue. That's sort of a really powerful way of doing things. But we've got what would be really nice, an extra sort of thing, is that sometimes you might want to see, well, why is this register or this variable got this particular value? Um, so we, we can do that for memory at the moment with a watch point. Why did this bit of memory get this particular value? Set a watch point, run backwards, found it. But sometimes the, the incorrect thing is actually a register value, not a memory value. And unfortunately, CPUs don't have hardware watch points for registers. Um, <coughs> but under DB, it does have access to that sort of information. In fact, recently we just added this new command, which will search go backwards to the most recent time that any of a set of registers have been written, have been read or, or, or written to. So um, this, this goes back to the most recent time that either register AX was read, or, B, or the register BP was read, or DS was written to. <coughs> um, so this is only possible because we have a record replay engine. Um, if you're trying to trace why registers have values without a backwards engine, you can't do it. The common are too, too big. You, got, you, you end up tracing millions of data flows and registers. It's just impossible. Um, so, but with, with, with a reversible debugger, you can modify the replay to, to add extra stuff to, make, to look at this information. And this is a sort of a general point, which I'll be talking about a bit more. Um, that we, we have a very powerful system that records what your program does. And now it, we, can, we can use it in different ways to find other information. So um, this is a, a new command that tells, looks at the current instruction. And in this case, it says, well, this is subtracting the, um, this value in memory from the register AX. Um, this is an Intel x86 64-bit instruction. Um, so under DB analyzes that instruction. It knows it reads this, this um, this memory address, because that's what BP points to. It knows, we're well, decrementing AX, so it must read AX and then write to it. So it tells you what that instruction is doing in terms of data. <coughs> um, so we can trace data backwards in time. If the, current, if the current instruction reads a memory location, we can set a watch point and go back. That tells us where that value came from. If the current instruction reads a register, <coughs> um, a single register, we you can use this new command to search for the most recent change to that register. Unfortunately, if the current instruction, and some of them do, uh, reads or writes more, reads more than one register, or reads register in memory, or I don't know whether any CPUs do this, reads more than one location in memory, we're a bit stuck because the data flow is is, is bifurcating. So what do we do? Well. Um, we've done this ex extra thing um, where we do under db data flow backwards explore start, which looks at the, what the current instruction is reading, and then we repeatedly do under db data flow backwards explore next. Apologies for the length of the command; it's a silly command, but there we go. Um, and this, what this does, it explores in the history of data that leading up to the current instruction. Um, so I'm going to give a demo. Um, I should say it's awfully slow at the moment. This is using a debug build of UndoDB, and it's um, there's all sorts of things it's doing in a really clumsy way. We do sometimes. Yes, yes, we do. Um, <laughs> it gets confusing. It's really useful. We, we, UndoDB consists of various processes. Uh, the really hard one, you can't. <laughs> Some of the less hard processes you can debug and well we in fact we do in fact we embed live recorder as we say we embed that in our code so we can 
uh, activate live recorder to record itself, um, which is kind of useful. Um, so this is my um, uh, development tree. I've got a test that does this, um, which I shall show you. So like, we use Python uh, to run tests. Um, and we use a, a cool um, build system that I wrote, which I might I haven't got time to talk about. But it's called YABS, which stands for Yet Another Build System. Um, and this is part of that, how it works. So um, this is test 4590. Uh, and this is the actual code that gets run to run the test. What we're going to do, we're going to create an underdb session. Um, we're going to set a breakpoint. Maybe I'll show you the, the, the actual uh, test 4590b. Is that right? What am I doing? 4519. Oh yeah, that's 519B. Um, so this is a program which just, it does some random calculations. There's no reason for any of this. It's just a way of getting a program that has some data that gets transformed in a useful way. So we're running that, and then we're going to run um, and explore. We're going to look at the last 13, that's a no, no particular reason, it, the last 13 changes to data. And then we're going to run this other Python script, which will generate a PNG file, and we'll show it in Firefox. So uh, I'm going to run this. It'll take maybe a minute or so. <coughs> That's building under DB, which is already up to date. Um, and now we're running. Um, so we're exploring backwards data flow here. We're in iteration 1 out of 13. They'll go faster later on. Um, so it's looking at the current instruction, which reads register AX. So it's now searching backwards for the most recent read to register AX. And now it's exploring the history. Um, while that's running, maybe I'll show you the... Uh, this is actually the, the, our Python extension that does this. Um, so... Um, might be able to see a little bit of what's going on there. So it's calling data explore next, and then explore next. Um, looks at the current instruction, seeing what operations it does, um, and then goes to here. And this performs a single reverse data flow operation. So it depends on whether it, the operation is a memory operation or a register operation, and it does a different sort of search. So this one, it's uh, you know set to watch point and then runs backwards. To just trace a register, you use a new command. Uh, so there we go. It's all worked. And there's another little Python script that was run that looks at the history and it creates a great little graph, which is sort of maybe worth having a look at. Um, can you see that? A little bit small. But, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go up to the beginning of this. So the... Um, the disassembly for the code we were, we, were, we were looking at is here, so the address is here. Um, these values at the beginning, they show the basic block count, which is a count of sort of basic blocks. Maybe I should tell you what a basic block is. Anybody not heard of a basic block? Okay, a basic block is a sequence of instructions, assembly instructions, machine code instructions, that end with a branch or jump. Um, so that's a basic block. It's easy operations ending with a jump. Basic blocks have a nice, the interesting property that they always complete. It'll always run all the instructions and then jump. Um, so underdb uses this as a very core part of its instrumentation. So this is another basic block that goes to probably th probably there as a jump instruction. So this num the, here, this number is a count of basic blocks, and this is a, p a program count of value. So this is. 400747, which is the starting point here. This instruction looks at this location in memory and moves it into register AX. So it reads memory and writes into a register. So what we did there, we said, well, where did that memory location come from? We, and what happened? We set a watch point on that memory location and said, well, who modified that, the memory location? And that's this, this red arrow here. And it turned out that the instruction at PC735, which is here, that wrote into that memory location. And you see that adds register EAX to whatever's in that memory location. Now, this is an interesting instruction because this, this reads two values. It depends on the value of EAX. It also, depending on the original value of that memory location. 
So as you go back, you can see it's, it's bifurcating. So this is following the memory input, and this is following the register input. So this is going backwards in time. You'll notice these values uh, are getting lower. So we're, we're ba basically saying this instruction here, this is what it depended on. This is the flow of data that led up to this instruction. Um, so it read, a, uh, um, it read a register value, which was found by reading an address, which was set by this instruction. So you can sort of see how we're exploring data flow history. We're finding the tree of where data came from. And I think potentially this is a, you know, a really powerful idea. I think, um, as I say, you can't do this without a reverse engine. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea. It, it's, I think it's, it's got a couple of, you know, may, maybe a couple of interesting particular uses. Um, I mean, I won't talk about that yet. Yeah, so for instance, one of the ideas I thought would be kind of useful for this, um, if we know, if we can find out where data's come from, we can synthesize test data to exercise certain bits of code. Um, if, we were in it, if we are at an if statement um, and we run the program and it's zero uh, or false, so the if isn't taken, we can sort of think, well, what would it take to make that if be taken? Um, so we could trace data back, and make, if we go back far enough, we'd probably end up to a read of a parameter of a something from a file or something like that. Um, and then we could change that file to, to so that we change the value so that if the statement is actually taken like, next time. So it's a, it's very like static, anal static analysis that people like Coverity do, um, but it's sort of it's static it's analysis based on the actual execution of your program. Which you know, it, I'm not saying static analysis is not any, often used. It's just a different take on that sort of analysis um, that we haven't up till now been able to e even do. Um, there's a couple of issues. Uh, one of them is that we only, at the moment, uh, the implementation only knows about general purpose registers. Um, often there's, um, I found actually in normal generated code that, 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 that the trail stops because an instruction actually reads from a non-general purpose register and writes into a general purpose register and because we can't track at the moment re, uh, modifications to non-general purpose registers, the, train, the trail stops, we can't go back any further. Um, I mean, that's fixable. It's a trivial sort of thing to fix, but we're working on that. Um, the other slightly more subtle thing, <coughs> um, if we're, this instruction here, it's adding EAX to a, uh, this memory location. Um, it has to read that memory location, obviously. Uh, slightly weird, but it, it, the memory location depends on register BP. So arguably, the sort of data flow, it depends on the value of, of, of the register BP. If register BP had a different value, it would have read from a different part in memory. Um, currently, we don't, we ignore that. Um, so that's, I'm not quite sure yet even how to think about this. It's, uh, you can, I can argue it both ways. Um, most of the time, maybe it doesn't really matter because, for instance, it, it, that's normally a stack pointer. Normally, your program doesn't really, the paper doesn't care the, the, the absolute location of the stack. So you don't really want to worry about what, who said, because if you, if you follow the stack, you'll, get, you'll always go back to our caller and its caller and its caller and eventually go back into libc where it set the initial, initial stack for your program. Uh, and that probably, most of the time, isn't actually important to the, the operation of your program. So for now, we... Could you filter it out for register? So you trace back, but don't trace this register? Yes, that would be a good way of doing it. Yeah, um, yeah, that would make good sense. Um, <clears throat> so, something more generally, um, UnderDB knows everything there is to know about the debuggy's execution. It can recreate the state at any point with instruction level granularity. Um, everything's available. So the problem now is not, revert, not finding out about your program, it's making that information into a form that you can use. Um, so normal reversible debugging the metaphor is use time and you go backwards and set breakpoints and stuff. But there are other ways of looking at the whole, the whole execution of your program. Um, we might want to change the in instrumentation on replay so that we count all access to memory or we could log all calls to a, a particular function. Um, the important might, we could maybe get a log of whenever we locked a particular mutex or 
um, go back to the last quarter function when a parameter was a particular value. The, the, the sort of the, we, we knew anything we like here we, because we have this such a general engine. Um, and, and the point here is that we can do all these things because at replay we can afford to change the way replay works, add extra analysis at replay that we didn't have when we recorded the program. I think this is a general sort of problem with analyzing the execution of a program. Um, without a reverse engine, you have to, in advance, decide what you're going to investigate. So you might want to track, I don't know, function calls. Um, and you can do that. There's, there's, there's techniques now you can track all function calls. <coughs> but what happens if you run your program and you've got all your function calls? You think, actually, what I really want to know is who accessed this bit of memory here? Well, you, you can't do that. The, the, the time is gone. With a reversible debugger, you can replay, but with different analysis in your engine. So you can, you, you've got a, a, a fantastic flexibility to sort of query what your program has done as a, in different ways without having to rerun it each time. And of course, if your program behaves differently each time it runs, then, it, then you, using a reversible debugger is kind of the, the only thing you can think of. I, I don't know whether anybody has any ideas of what would be useful to. Sorry? You can do very advanced profiling. <coughs> yes, yes. We said, like, each function, well, a specific function, if it's, if it's get access more with different parameters, you might want to optimize it out. Yep. Yes, definitely. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the things we could possibly do, um, uh, we have some code that gets control every basic block and effectively analyze, has, has access to the registers and stuff of the program. And that's how we do these sort of searches of things. Um, one option is that the user could provide some code that is, it gets run inside our engine to, to an, do whatever analysis it wants. Um, uh, this is a slightly different world from C++. This code has a very restricted stack, no libc, no malloc. We're, we're, we're very much sort of low level here. So it might be a bit of a problem, it might be a bit hard, but you could, you could do it. Um, so that's a, a one option we're thinking of. <coughs> um, oddly enough, quite by chance, somebody else, about two years ago, wrote an amazing system called Expositor, which I, <coughs> I won't describe because I didn't write it. Um, they used UnduDB and GDB's Python extension to do a system for lazily querying different aspects of the execution of a program. Um, which was phenomenal, really. I, I think he found a very subtle bug in Firefox using this. Um, which is exactly the sort of thing I'd kind of, I'd like to happen. You know, the, the idea that somebody can take our reversible debugging engine and just do cool stuff, do cool queries with it is, is wonderful. Um, so that's kind of worth a look at some point. Um, so I think that's all I have to talk about right now. Do we have any, any questions? Got a question. Yeah. How would I use this on a multi-core environment? How would you use it on a multi-core environment? Uh, you just run it as normal. Okay. Um, it will only use one core in practice. Um, so just use it as normal. Would I, would I possibly have four debuggers running uh, all on each core and they're all talking to each other through some shared memory and, and they... <laughs> yeah, they would they... Uh, hit a point or something? So yeah, so the question is would you um, have multiple debuggers, one per core. Um, yes, uh, this is interesting because um, the slowdown that we have when we run a program is between two and four times for a CPU bound thread. Uh, but because we serialize threads, there's an additional slowdown if, all, if you have multiple CPU bound threads. And um, yeah, this is it's a bit embarrassing for us. We don't want to run programs too slowly. One of the ways of improving things is exactly what you're saying, is to treat uh, multi-threaded programs as, as effectively what they often are in Linux, as separate processes that, can, that have shared memory. Um, and it's a big job because it's, because uh, 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 there's always an overhead to recording shared memory accesses. But you're right, that's, that's the approach we may well take to doing this. Um, as I say, it's a quite a large chunk of work. It's, you know, probably a ma half a man year or something like that to get it working. Um, and there's always the danger that because of the shared memory overheads, you end up not actually running much faster. So that's, that's an interesting idea. 
I'm going to ask something that might be a silly question. Mm -hmm. If you're using a live recorder, could you get the, the current value of the, the basic block that you're running at that for instruction so you, that you might log it to know that you can come back to that function? So the question was if you're running a live recorder, uh, could you get in the, the basic block number and log it? Um, that's an inter interesting one. We have thought about that. Um, you have to be kind of careful about this sort of thing. It wouldn't be precise because you would lug it later. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, uh, actually, th there's a slightly, you can go a little bit beyond that because one of the things we're looking at is um, allowing people to use UnderDB's engine to add reversible capabilities to an emulator. Um, and that, if, you can run an emulator backwards um, easily. But that doesn't quite get you running your Java or whatever it is you're running backwards. I mean, it does a state, but you then need to update, somehow give a view of what the state of the Java virtual machine is. Um, and to do that, we might well provide hooks into the internal, to, into the basic block hand, if you like. If not that, if you could set a break, uh, not a breakpoint, but sort of a like, marker inside the, the, the log. So yes, set a marker inside the log as your program runs. Um, yes, that's a really interesting idea because um, it would enable you to um, add, you know, add extra inform useful information to the log. So that when you load into NDDB, <coughs> rather than just a basic block count, you have, oh, here, the, the application was opening a dialog box to, to, to say a certain thing, which isn't, the information is always available, but it just makes the information much more, use, much more uh, visible. Um, so you're exactly, exactly right, that'd be really useful. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody else? Yeah, is the program do a lot of uh, input output uh, operation, uh, a lock, uh, a big, huge? Uh, oh, so the question is if the program does lots of input output operations, does the log get huge? Um, <coughs> excuse me. If it outputs a lot of data, it doesn't affect the log at all. We don't care with data that's sent out to the outside world because that data is not required in order to replay what the program did. Um, if your program reads a lot of data in, then yes, our log can fill up very, very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, the log is in memory. Um, so there is a, that's a limitation. Um, we can make the log circular so you can carry on running. Um, but yes, if you're reading vast amounts of data, it, it, under DB is less effective. Would it be possible to say, like, exclude, instead of for files that are read on the system, say, like, if these match a pattern, only log the file, the path of the file, and not the memory that was read? And so can you, can you repeat so, the question so again? In the, in the log, instead of, if, if we know that certain files are immutable under the file system, could you just mm. log the path and then log the ah, set? Yes. Program? So the question is, if the program loads a file that we know is immutable, um, then we don't need to take a copy of the file in memory in replay. We just read the file again for real. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, we do have a, a flag uh, which we wrote years and years ago, which I think is still there. I'm not sure how, whether we use it, which is to mark certain .so files as immutable for precisely that reason. Uh, so, yeah, that's an interesting one. It, the danger here is that we're, we're a debugger and uh, we, all, we, we work with programs with bugs in them and it's kind of important we don't make a mistake. And it's also kind of important that the user doesn't make a mistake <laughs> as well. If, if the user says this file is immutable and actually it's changed, um, you could get ever so confused because it would look like a bug in UnderDB. Um, if you're debugging something like a, a video player or a, something that we have that might be like hundreds and not pieces of mag. Yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're debugging a video player, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I think it's a, it's a useful idea. And, I, um, so, and I, I'm not sure we don't, I don't think we document it, but there is a hook in there for doing exactly what you're suggesting, um, which is a useful idea. Yeah. Does, yeah. So you said that the, all the threads are serialized. Uh, is it in a predictable order which threads are woken up, or is it somewhat randomized so it more approximates uh, stuff that runs in parallel? So we. Uh, so, so is the thread switching randomized? Yeah. Um, what we do, we leave it up to the, the operating system, the kernel, 
Um, so we run a thread for a certain amount of time. If it doesn't make a blocking system call or something like that, if, it just, if it's CPU banned, we, we stop it. Um, and we have a single global mutex, and other threads we, will be blocked on that global mutex. And the, one of them will then get the chance to grab the mutex, and it'll be the kernel that decides which one gets it. So um, if the kernel thinks that this thread blocked on this uh, futex, like the next mutex sort of primitive, is more important than this thread here, which is doing something else, then it gets to control which thread is run next. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect. Um, because we have we we have a preemptive thing. There's a, there's an in, if you're all CPU CPU bound threads, um, the granularity of thread switching is up to us. But beyond that, the, the kernel gets to decide. Um, so so I, I imagine that if there's some strange thread priority system that the, the debugging is using, then that will still work with under DB. Yeah, so the question was, um, we run on Linux, but which other restrictions, what GDB version we use and things, other, other restrictions. Um, not really. We need a relatively recent GDB. It has to be GDB 7. There's a, that when you run a, if you print out the variable, a, var a variable value, um, w the, the, the GDB does that by running a function in the debug E. Um, we have to be quite careful about that because we don't want to change the state of the debuggy. Um, and there's a thing we call the inf call patch. We patch GDB to fix a little problem it has with this sort of thing. Um, but aside from that, there's no real restriction. Um, we don't, in, in general, because we don't really worry about symbols, symbolic information, we, we're just working purely in terms of machine code instructions. Um, we're pretty we're pretty insulated from version numbers of, 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 of libraries and whatever. How hard would it be to port it to uh, CDB on Windows or any other debugger? question was how hard would it be to port to GDB on Windows? Um, if you're talking about running a debuggy on Windows, um, the answer is practically impossible, <laughs> 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 I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> the, the, the trouble is that UnderDB has to know about what every single system call does so that it can record it and replay it reliably. Um, with Linux, um, you, it's well documented, and ultimately you have the source code of the kernel. So if there's something you're not quite sure about, look in the kernel, I'll tell you what it does. Um, with Windows, I, I mean, part of the NCOs, uh, myself and Greg, who started the company, we don't know anything about Windows. Um, so we don't, I've, I've no idea, I mean Linux has I, I, something like a few hundred system calls. I've no idea how many Windows has. I don't know whether they're documented in a way that would be suitably detailed for us. We'd probably almost certainly have to get access to the Windows kernel. Uh, so it's a big problem. Um, it, it's a shame because it'd be a massive market for us, it'd be marvellous. Um, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. Maybe someone in Microsoft might be interested in something. Possibly, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm very happy for, I, I don't, I've never, I've programmed a bit on Windows, and I, I, I'm not an anti-Windows person, but I never particularly enjoyed it, um, so I wouldn't be the one to do it, they'd have to get somebody uh, who knows a lot more about Windows than I do, or any of us do, um, yeah. Do we work on BSD? No. We only work on, um, only work on Linux, um, mainly, well, it's, it's because we need to know about every system call. Um, w there's nothing in theory to stop us working on BSD. It would be um, something like a year of work or something, maybe a bit more than that. The thing is, we've ported between CPUs. We've done that with three or four CPUs now, so we know how to do that. We've never ported to a different operating system, so I'm sure there'd be some new stuff that we have to cope with. And the thing is, we have to know about um, signals in particular are pretty grim. You have this weird thing where something comes in asynchronously, may or may not cause a signal, hand cause a signal handler to be called. The signal handler actually makes some strange system calls that set up an environment for the signal handler to run. It's really, really tricky in Linux, and I suspect it's just as tricky in one of the BSDs. 
Um, and the other thing is that um, sort of from a commercial point of view, that I don't think there's a market you know, for that, for that, that would, that would make, justify us making, doing all the work. Um, it's a lot of work to do this. It, it, we've been running 10 years. Um, there was sort of three of us did most of the code in the first maybe six, seven years. And then we've now got 12, no, we've got 10 developers, I think, now. Um, depending how you measure it, there's between 200 and 500,000 lines of code in here. Um, so it's, it's hard to do that sort of work, and, and you need quite a strong commercial case to justify it. Any more uh, questions, or are we, are we happy? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll finish there then. Thank you.